Hello, I'm John Cottrell from Matrix Science. This introductory presentation gives a short overview of the different ways in which we can use mass spectrometry data for protein identification and characterization. If, if you are new to the field, this is a key presentation. We will introduce the topics which will be explored in greater detail in the subsequent talks. There are three proven ways of using mass spectrometry data for protein identification. The first of these is known as a peptide mass fingerprint. This was the original method to be developed and uses the molecular masses of the peptides resulting from digestion of the protein by a specific enzyme. Peptide mass fingerprinting can only be used with a pure protein or a very simple mixture. So the starting point will often be a spot of a 2D gel. The protein is digested with an enzyme of high specificity, usually trypsin because this is reliable and inexpensive and produces peptides of a suitable size, but any specific enzyme can be used. The resulting mixture of peptides is analyzed by mass spectrometry. This yields a set of molecular mass values which is searched against a database of protein sequences using a search engine. For each entry in the protein database, the search engine simulates the known cleavage specificity of the enzyme, calculates the masses of the predicted peptides, and compares this set of calculated mass values with the set of experimental mass values. Some type of scoring is then used to identify the entry in the database that gives the best match and a report is generated. I'll discuss the subject of scoring in greater detail later. If the mass spectrum of your peptide digest mixture looks as good as this, and it's a single protein, and the protein sequence or something very similar is in the database, your chances of success are very high. We don't submit the raw data to the search engine. First of all, the spectrum must be reduced to a peak list. That is, a set of mass and intensity pairs, one for each peak. We call this procedure peak detection or peak picking. In a peptide mass fingerprint, it's the mass values of the peaks that matter most. The peak area or intensity values are a function of peptide basicity, length, and several other physical and chemical parameters. There's no particular reason to assume that a big peak is interesting and a small peak is less interesting. The main use of intensity is simply to distinguish signal from noise. Mass accuracy is important, but so is coverage. Better to have a large number of mass values with moderate accuracy than one or two mass values with very high accuracy. These presentations will focus on MASCOT, but you should be aware that there are several other peptide mass fingerprint search engines on the web. There are also software packages available for download that run locally or are sold as commercial products. Some of the early search engines, such as Mouse and Peptide Search, are no longer available. This is the mascot search form for a peptide mass fingerprint. Besides the mass spec data, a number of search parameters are required. Some search engines require fewer parameters, others require more. We'll be discussing these search parameters in detail in a later presentation. In theory, you could design a search engine that didn't require search parameters and tried to work everything out from the mass values. But this would be very inefficient. If you know the enzyme was trypsin, much easier to supply this information as part of the search. To perform a search, you paste your peak list into the search form or upload it as a file, enter values for the search parameters and press the submit button. A short while later, you receive the results. A peptide mass fingerprint search will almost always produce a list of matching proteins and something has to be at the top of that list. One of the big problems in the early days of the technique was how to tell whether the top match was real or simply the match that happened to be at the top of the list, that is, a false positive. 
there have been various attempts to deal with this problem, which I will describe in a later presentation when we come to discuss scoring. If you want to learn more about the origins and development of peptide mass fingerprinting, I can recommend this review by the Genentech group. They discuss the history and the methodology in a very readable style. One of the strengths of peptide mass fingerprinting is that it is an easy experiment that can be performed using just about any type of mass spectrometer. The whole process is readily automated, and MOLDI instruments in particular can churn out high accuracy PMF data at a very high rate. In principle, it is a sensitive technique because you don't need 100% coverage. It doesn't matter too much if a small part of the protein fails to digest, or if some of the peptides are insoluble, or don't fly in the instrument very well. One of the limitations is that you do need to work with a database of proteins or nucleic acid sequences that are equivalent to proteins, for example messenger RNAs. In most cases, you simply won't get satisfactory results from an EST database, where most of the entries correspond to protein fragments, or genomic DNA, where there is a continuum of sequence, possibly containing regions coding for multiple proteins as well as non-coding sequences. This is because the statistics of the technique rely on the set of mass values having originated from a defined protein sequence. If multiple sequences are combined in a single entry, or if the sequence is divided across multiple entries, the numbers simply don't work so well. If the protein sequence or something very similar is not in the database, the method will fail. If you are studying a well-characterized organism, such as human or mouse or yeast, this is unlikely to be a problem. If you are studying a virus or a plant with an unsequenced genome, it can be a major problem, and you depend on getting matches to homologous proteins from related organisms. However, the most important limitation concerns mixtures. If the data quality is very good, it may be possible to identify a two-component mixture where both components are at a similar level. On very, very rare occasions, maybe three components. But if the data are poor, it can be difficult to get any match at all out of a mixture, and it's never possible to identify a minor component. To identify proteins from mixtures reliably, you have to work at the peptide level. That is, you have to work with MSMS data. The experimental workflow for database matching of MSMS data is similar to that for peptide mass fingerprinting, but with an added stage of selectivity and fragmentation. Again, we start with a protein, which can now be either a single protein or a complex mixture of proteins. Again, we use an enzyme such as trypsin to digest the protein or proteins into peptides. If it is a complex mixture, such as a whole cell lysate, we will probably need to use one or more stages of chromatography to regulate the flow of peptides into the mass spectrometer. We need to be able to select peptides one at a time using the first stage of mass analysis. Then each isolated peptide is induced to fragment, possibly by collision, and the second stage of mass analysis is used to collect an MSMS spectrum. Because we are collecting data from isolated peptides, it makes no difference whether the original sample was a mixture or not. We identify peptide sequences and then try to assign them to one or more protein sequences. One consequence is that unless a peptide is unique to one particular protein, there may be ambiguity as to which protein it should be assigned to. For each MSMS spectrum, we use software to try and determine which peptide sequence in the database gives the best match. As in the case with a peptide mass fingerprint, each entry in the database is digested in silico and the masses of the expected peptides are calculated. 
If the calculated peptide mass matches the experimental one, the mass values expected to result from the gas phase fragmentation of the peptide are also calculated, and the degree of matching of these peaks to the MSMS spectrum is scored. Unlike a peptide mass fingerprint, use of a specific enzyme is not essential. By looking at all possible subsequences of each entry that fit the precurmat, precursor mass, it is possible to match peptides even though the enzyme specificity is unknown, such as endogenous peptides. Database matching of MSMS data is possible because peptide molecular ions fragment at preferred locations along the backbone. In many instruments, the major peaks in an MSMS spectrum are the B ions, where the charge is retained on the N-terminus and Y-ions when the charge is retained on the C-terminus. However, this does depend on the ionization technique, the mass analyzer and the peptide structure. Electron capture dissociation, for example, produces predominantly C and Z ions. If peptides fragmented cleanly and uniformly along the backbone, we wouldn't actually need database search. In the spectrum, we would see a ladder of peaks for each ion series, where the distance from one peak to the next was the mass of an amino acid residue, allowing the sequence simply to be read off from the spectrum. In real life, fragmentation is rarely perfect, and the spectrum will usually show significant peaks from side chain cleavages, internal fragments where the backbone has been cleaved twice, and various kinds of rearrangements. More importantly, the backbone may fail to cleave at certain locations so that the MSMS spectrum has no evidence for some of the residues. This slide shows the most common fragment structures and the table is a ready reckoner that can be used to calculate the masses of particular ions. N is the mass of the N-terminal group, which is hydrogen for a free amine, C is the mass of the C-terminal group, which is a hydroxyl for a free acid, and M is the sum of the residue masses. At the bottom is a reference to a review by Janos Papayanopoulos, which provides an excellent introduction to the fragmentation chemistry of peptide ions in the gas phase. This brings us to the second method of using mass spectrometry data for protein ID, a sequence query, in which the mass information is combined with amino acid sequence or composition data. The most widely used approach in this category is the sequence tag, developed by Matthias Mann and Matthias Wilm at the European Molecular Biology Lab. In a sequence tag search, a few residues of amino acid sequence are interpreted from the MSMS spectrum. Even when the quality of the spectrum is poor, it is often possible to pick out four clean peaks and read off three residues of sequence. In a sequence homology search, a triplet would be worth almost nothing, since any given triplet can be expected to occur by chance many times, even in a small database. What Mann and Wilm realised was that this very short stretch of amino acid sequence might provide sufficient specificity to provide an unambiguous identification if it was combined with the fragment ion mass values which enclose it, the peptide mass, and the knowledge of the enzyme specificity. Picking out a good tag is not trivial and requires both luck and experience. In this spectrum, we can see a promising four residue tag. The syntax used by Mascot for a sequence tag is shown below the spectrum. We'll discuss this format in greater detail in the sequence query presentation. There are a number of software packages for sequence query searches. As with peptide mass fingerprinting, I've limited my list to servers that are publicly available on the web. Not such a wide choice as for peptide mass fingerprinting. 
I've entered the tag shown earlier into the mascot sequence query search form. As with a peptide mass fingerprint, a number of search parameters are required, such as the database to be searched and an estimate of the mass accuracy. Again, we press submit and a short while later we'll get our results. This is the result report from searching that particular tag. There's just one peptide in the database that matches, this particular one from bovine trypsinogen. The score is good, but even if it wasn't, you're on pretty safe ground accepting matches to trypsin, keratin or BSA. A sequence tag search can be rapid because it is simply a filter on the database. However, the standard sequence tag is essentially obsolete. It is easier and more reliable to skip the interpretation step and pass the peak list to the search engine. The reason the sequence tag is still important is because it can be used in an error tolerant mode. This consists of relaxing the specificity by removing the peptide molecular mass constraint. The tag is effectively allowed to float within the candidate sequence so that a match is possible even if there is a difference in the calculated mass to one side or the other of the tag. This is one of the few ways of getting a match to a peptide when there is an unsuspected modification or some variation in the primary amino acid sequence. Tags can be called by software, but in many cases they are still called manually, which requires time and skill. If the tag is not correct, then no match will be returned. In mascot, ambiguity is OK as long as it is recognised and the query is formulated correctly. Obviously, uh, because the masses are identical, we never know whether we're looking at isoleucine or leucine. And unless you've got very good mass accuracy, uh, you don't know whether you're looking at glutamine or lysine, or phenylalanine or oxidised methionine. Software or a table of mass values can help identify the more common ambiguities. But even so, it's very difficult to identify all possible ambiguities, especially when we have to allow for missing peaks. Which brings us to our third category, searching the uninterpreted MSMS data, possibly from a single peptide or possibly from a complete LC MSMS run. That is, we are using software to match the peak list directly without any manual sequence calling. This approach was pioneered by John Yates and Jimmy Eng at the University of Washington in Seattle. They used a cross-correlation algorithm to compare an experimental MSMS spectrum against spectra predicted from peptide sequences from a database. Their ideas were implemented as the Sequest program. There is now a wide choice of search engines on the web for performing searches of uninterpreted MSMS data. I've also listed some of the packages that are not on the web, which include Sequest, and are available either for download or uh, as commercial products. As with a peptide mass fingerprint, the starting point is always the peak list. There are several different formats for MSMS peak lists, and this may constrain your choice of search engine. This is the mascot search form for an MSMS search, fairly similar to the previous two and, as before, you must specify various search parameters such as the database, mass accuracy, modifications, etc, etc. The results from this type of search tend to be more complicated to report. This is because the results usually represent a large number of MSMS spectra rather than a single spectrum. We match peptide sequences to individual MSMS spectra, then try to assign these peptide sequences to proteins. Usually, there is some degree of ambiguity, and we aim to report a minimal list of proteins. That is, the shortest list of proteins that accounts for all the observed peptide matches. So, the report lists a series of proteins, and for each protein, it lists the peptide matches that are the evidence for that protein. But there is also an additional dimension to the data. For each spectrum, 
there may be multiple possible peptide matches. This particular mascot report uses a pop-up window to show the alternative peptide matches to each spectrum. In this case, the top match has a high score and the other matches are low scoring random matches, so there's no interest in these lower scoring matches. In other cases, the top two or three matches may all be interesting, such as a phosphopeptide, where there are several potential phosphorylation sites and moving the phosphate from one site to another only changes the score slightly. To summarise, searching of uninterpreted MSMS data is readily automated for high throughput work. Most proteomics pipelines use this approach. It offers the possibility of getting useful matches from spectra of marginal quality, where it would not be possible to call a reliable sequence tag. Imagine a weak or noisy spectrum that gets a match with a poor score. In isolation, this might be insufficient evidence for the presence of a particular protein. But if there are other similar quality spectra with matches to the same peptide or to other peptides from the same protein, taken together and with the right safeguards, they can provide a degree of confidence that the peptide truly has been identified. On the downside, such searches can be slow, particularly if performed without enzyme specificity or with many variable modifications. Finally, always remember that it is peptides that are being identified, not proteins. From the peptides that have been identified, we try to infer which proteins were present in the sample, but this often carries some ambiguity. To complete this overview, I'd like to compare the fundamental characteristics of database searching using MS data versus searching with MSMS data. The mass spectrum of a triptych digest of a protein of average size might contain 50 peptide masses, not dissimilar from the number of fragments in the MSMS spectrum of an, of an average size triptych peptide. Thus, the information content of the individual spectra is quite similar. The reason MSMS searches are perceived to be more powerful is mainly that the data set often contains many spectra, multiplying the information content. However, at the single spectrum level, there may be little to choose. In a peptide mass fingerprint, the boundary condition is that the peptides all originate from a single protein. In an MSMS search, the boundary condition is that the fragments all originate from a single peptide. The weakness of peptide mass fingerprinting is that this boundary condition is often violated and the spectrum actually represents the digest products of a protein mixture. The MSMS boundary condition can also be violated when we analyze co-eluting isobaric peptides. When this happens, if we have a mixture, the MSMS search is just as likely to fail as the peptide mass fingerprint. However, we tend not to notice this because there are many reasons why spectra fail to get matches, such as unsuspected modifications or incorrect precursor mass or charge. We don't normally investigate the causes of these failures, so we don't see that some of these are due to acquiring a mixed MSMS spectrum. In the peptide mass fingerprint, the specificity comes from the predictable cleavage behaviour of the proteolytic enzyme. Thus, we want an enzyme with a low cutting frequency, such as trypsin. In the MSMS iron search, the specificity comes from the mostly predictable gas phase fragmentation behaviour of peptide molecular ions. In a peptide mass fingerprint, we tend to be unsure of the exact protein mass. Even if the sample is a spot off a 2D gel, there is no guarantee that the database sequence corresponds to the fully processed protein. For MSMS, we tend to be unsure which type of fragments are present. There is often a dependency on the protein sequence or on a modification, so we might get B ions in one case, mostly Y ions in another, and a combination of B and Y ions in a third spectrum. Also, Depending on presence of certain modifications, there might be neutral losses or there might be multiple charge states. <laughs>
Arguably, the major strength of a peptide mass fingerprint is that it really is shotgun protein identification. The higher the coverage, the more confident we become that the protein in the database truly is the one in the sample. In MSMS searching, we often have much lower coverage, but the strength of searching MSMS data is that one is getting residue level information. A good match can reveal the presence and location of post-translational modifications, which is never possible in a peptide mass fingerprint. Finally, if you are looking for a recommendation for a textbook, um, this one covers the whole field clearly and systematically. It's not simply a, a loose collection of research papers.